This week on Waterways. The invasive exotic batfish. Message in a bottle project. And coral rescue in Key West. The Florida Keys attracts millions of visitors each year who come to view the underwater wonders of the coral reef ecosystem. Most visitors are welcome, but a few, outlaws and potential troublemakers, are not. Two recent exotic visitors came all the way from the Indo-Pacific Ocean. Known as orbicular batfish, they would soon face exile. The, the batfish sightings have been at Molasses Reef in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, specifically the existing management area of the old Key Largo National Marine Sanctuary, about five miles off the coast of Key Largo, uh, not too far from Pentacamp State Park. It also happens to be one of our sanctuary preservation areas, uh, so these fish are enjoying uh, a higher level of protection uh, in, the, in the preservation area and would not likely be caught uh, on their own accord because of, their, of where they're residing. The very first time we saw these batfish, we were actually on a fish survey project with a group of our volunteers, and one of our volunteers came up talking about a strange-looking spadefish, you know, Atlantic spadefish. And they said it wasn't a spadefish, but they had no idea what it was. And we went down and saw the fish and did some research and found out that it was an Indo-Pacific batfish, uh, orbicular batfish is the species name. And that was back in the, in the mid-90s that we first saw the very first batfish out of Molasses Reef. Resource managers and organizations like Reef were aware of the dangers introduced species posed to an environment. For years, biologists have documented the negative impacts to natural ecosystems when exotic species are introduced. And basically, you have a, a fish community that has evolved here naturally, and that is a normal native fish community. Anything that gets introduced from another ocean that has not come here naturally would be an introduced species, and we also refer to that as exotic species, not from this area. Um, and there are a lot of potential dangers that could follow that. Uh, they can outcompete native species in their foraging. They could be a top of the line predator and eat other fish that are native here. They can bring disease that our native species aren't uh, resistant to. Uh, so a lot of issues surround the uh, invasive species. Exotic species, those introduced by humans, are a growing problem in the United States at an estimated cost to the U.S. economy of more than $100 billion a year. A study by researchers from Reef and the University of Washington documented 16 non-native marine fish species off the coast of the United States. The Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary and the state of Florida rules prohibit the release of exotics, and even though it's against the law, these fish still appear. There's always been a big question as to how these invasive or exotic species end up where they are in non-native waters. And a couple of the theories were that they could have been introduced in bilge water from large ships, which actually pick up water in one destination and use it for ballast. When they get to another destination and load cargo on, they offload the ballast water. So if you have small fish or larvae or eggs, potentially they could be released into the water. Uh, but another theory was that they could be pets. They could be aquarium fish that a hobbyist has had and you know grown to love and care for but maybe outgrown a tank or the Aquarius moves to another area they're not going to be able to keep the fish so rather than flushing it down the toilet or or killing it they think they're doing the fish a favor by releasing it into the nearby waters and hope that it'll live a long and prosperous life well that's that's completely understandable but I think most of those people don't know about the dangers that they could be causing Reports of Indo-Pacific batfish on Molasses Reef led to the capture of two fish in 2001, but a third remained. With no breeding partner for the fish, sanctuary managers decided not to pursue it. But several years later, reef volunteers and interns once again began reporting the presence of multiple batfish at Molasses Reef. 
Soon, Sanctuary members and Reef decided to mount a second capture, with the Florida Aquarium agreeing to lend their collecting skills and provide a permanent home for the fish. In looking at the, at the issue, uh, obviously we have a suite of options on how to deal with these fish. And probably the simplest and the easiest way to deal with them would be to go out and spear them or catch them on hook and line and, and that's it. Just like we cut down exotic tree species we don't want. But I think if we, if we think about our best option, using these fish as an educational tool to teach people more about what's dangerous about exotic species and what they can do, even though it costs more and, and is more labor intensive, is probably the best route. And it's humane. In the summer of 2004, a team was assembled to capture the two batfish and put an end to their vacation on Molasses Reef. A plan was developed incorporating spotters snorkeling above and divers hunting below for the two batfish. Knowing that the batfish were often seen in the same areas on the reef, the search was slightly easier than a needle in a haystack. Local dive boat crews confirmed that the exotics were sticking close to a section of molasses known as the winch hole. By setting nets around the reef area, the captors gave the batfish little chance of escape. When all the nets are set, the hunt begins. The divers soon spot the first batfish, but the batfish sees them. Diving for cover, the batfish hides under a reef ledge, limiting access for the hunter and his net. With a little teamwork, the batfish is soon pried from its crevice and chased into a second wading net. Thanks to the expertise of the Florida Aquarium, the survival of the batfish was never in doubt. One down, one to go. Soon the second batfish joins his mate in the tank on board. Mission accomplished. We are in a situation here where we can, an ounce of prevention could be worth a pound of cure. Uh, it's in other examples where exotic species have either been introduced or uh, both either intentionally or unintentionally, uh, it's become a problem of, of such magnitude that they're, you know, they can't throw enough money at it or effort at it to, to get a hold of the problem. Here it's a very clear case of being able to uh, be proactive and prevent a potentially very bad situation. And NOAA is, is working uh, globally with other nations, other countries, and states to, to uh, come up with a sensible policy uh, and uh, steps or technologies, methods to prevent the spread and the introduction of those species in the marine environment. The proactive nature of the batfish capture is an immediate solution to an impending problem. But the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary and Reef hope to prevent a need for such an operation again in the future. And the fish themselves will serve as poster children of the Florida Aquarium for a campaign to educate the public on the dangers of releasing exotic species. Such educational campaigns to prevent the introduction of non-native species are a priority for state and federal agencies. However, if species are introduced into the Florida Keys marine ecosystem, a system is in place to identify and manage the problem before it becomes unmanageable. Now, one of the things the reef is doing is we're actually tracking exotic invasive species in South Florida uh, on our website. We have a special page set up that people can go to report their sightings. And actually, Miami-Dade County and, and Broward County are the hotbed for exotic species. Local divers and dive operators may be the first line of defense in protecting the natural resource from exotic invaders. A collaboration between those that make a living on the reef and the managers in charge of preserving it is more important than ever. As the world becomes smaller and historical borders disappear, the task of preserving the natural environment becomes more difficult. While removing two exotic specimens from the Keys marine ecosystem may seem minor, eliminating hundreds of thousands that propagate from those two would be almost impossible.
In the quest for understanding of the natural world, technology has played a large role. From satellites tracking tagged fish, to genetically testing blood to determine the origin of a species, technology has brought conservation ecology to new levels. But technology will never replace motivation and ingenuity. Just ask conch researcher Bob Glazer. What we've done is des design this project, which is very low tech, uh, which examines the water current patterns and those forces that serve to entrain the conch within the Florida system. What we've done is to release about 8,500 glass drift vials throughout the Florida Keys, Mexico, and the Straits of the Yucatan and the Straits of Florida. Inside the drift vials, Glazer's team has placed a piece of waterproof paper that says, in both English and Spanish, to report finding the vials to a toll-free 800 number in Florida. The letter goes on to explain that the caller will be entered in a prize drawing for $250, and receive a conch restoration hat. But why is a conch researcher concerned with water flow? Well, obviously, the, the flow of the Gulf Stream was very well known and is very well known, but the processes that are more at a smaller scale, that is the ones from the back reef areas, individual reefs, and how they serve to, uh, to collect larvae and deposit larvae is not known. Because of the collapse of conch populations in the Keys, the commercial fishing of conch was banned in 1975. A decade later, in 1986, the recreational fishing was banned as well. Since then, resource managers have been searching for the best means to jumpstart the conch recovery. The conch's numbers seem to be too low for the population to recover on its own. The obvious solution was to create more of a base population for reproduction. At first, managers looked into raising conch larvae in indoor hatcheries and then transplanting those conch to their natural marine habitat. However, Glazer and his team soon came up with a simpler, much cheaper means to that end. In Florida, however, there's an unusual circumstance that we have to deal with. Near shore, that is up against the shore where a subset of the population is found, they never reproduce. Their gonads just never develop. Offshore, they do develop. Uh, the ones that are near shore, however, cannot move offshore because Hawk Channel uh, serves as a barrier to both juveniles and adults. They don't like that type of habitat. We found that we could transplant them offshore and within about six months, they'll begin to reproduce again. For five years, Glazer and a long list of local volunteers have transplanted nearshore conch which lack the ability to propagate to offshore waters. To date, they've transplanted over 3,000 conch, which using hatchery animals would have cost anywhere from $30,000 to $300,000. So far, the populations are beginning to recover in selected areas. But for the maximum effect, Glazer had to figure out if the conch he transplanted were producing larvae that were retained within the Keys marine system. The state of Florida has, is funding this program along with the ExxonMobil Foundation. And because of that, there is very, uh, the interest is in reco recovery of the Florida population. Obviously, some larvae will float away up to Bermuda and other locations and the Bahamas and, and help those populations, but that was not the primary concern of this study. Our concern was the restoration and recovery of the South Florida conch population and ultimately the South Florida recreational conch fishery. Glazer expects the study to determine where the optimal location is to transplant conch, so the larval output is increased in the Florida Keys. Glazer does not want to put conch into areas where the larvae that are produced will float away to Bermuda. He and his colleagues want to put them in areas where it is likely that they will be settling back into Florida and thus increasing the Florida conch population. The bottle is uh, made of glass and it floats right at the surface of the water. The reason it floats right at the surface and it doesn't float above the surface is because we put a little bit of sand on the bottom and that keeps the, the bottle uh, floating at just the right attitude. The air keeps it buoyant and the sand just provides enough ballast to keep it right at the surface of the water so that winds do not push the, push the bottles. We're more concerned with the water currents and we don't really want to see what wind processes are doing. 
An early concern while designing the vials was the ingestion of the vials by marine creatures such as turtles. To reduce the chances that the vials will be eaten, Glazer's team painted the bottoms of the vials blue to blend in with the surrounding sea. Then the tops were painted orange to enhance visibility. There has been a study that was done in, in Hawaii that showed that uh, squid that were painted blue on long lines were avoided more often uh, because of the color. So we are trying to avoid any type of negative interactions with other animals and I think we've been pretty successful at that. The size of the bottles is also designed to uh, be a, such that it will be passed easily through a, uh, a turtle that is commonly found here. The vials were released from June 1st to July 1st, 2004. Almost immediately, Glazer was getting recoveries, especially from those vials released in the Middle Keys. Preliminarily, I think we can say this. First of all, larvae that are within the Gulf Stream have a high probability of bypassing the Keys and winding up in Miami or above. Uh, animals, however, that are produced within the Keys system or north of the Gulf Stream, which includes the Tortugas region, will wind up staying within the Keys system and depositing back to the Keys. So we have a very uh, local type of process that, that occurs here. And in fact, uh, it is probably what it, more of a closed system that is not receiving animals from outside than an open system. Glazer has already proven that his team is increasing conch breeding populations in offshore waters. Now he needs to prove that these sexually active conch are populating the local waters with their offspring. Through the Message in the Bottle project, Glazer hopes to refine his larger goal, restoring to historic population levels this symbol of the Florida Keys. Protecting the marine environment is often a complicated affair, wrapped in discussions of laws, policies, and regulations. But sometimes, protecting the marine environment is as simple as painstakingly saving one coral at a time, as in a recent case of a massive coral rescue project completed by the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary and its partners. In November of 2003, I began working on a project with the U.S. Navy in an effort to bring a battleship group, training group, from Puerto Rico to Key West. The Navy had asked us to get in the water and look at what's out there and sort of determine what kind of impacts the project would have. So we did that and when we did, we uh, actually accomplished that survey, we found that there were a great number of corals, much, many more corals than we thought ever could exist in a harbor like Key West Harbor. Working with the two agencies, contractors, and other partners, McLaughlin launched a massive rescue project, trying to remove as many corals as possible from the seawall before demolition and construction began. In the chilly winter waters of Key West Harbor, McLaughlin and others donned scuba gear and spent hundreds of hours underwater, hammers and chisels in hand. Uh, we use chisels and chipping hammers, very fine bladed tools, because the corals do sort of meld or, or grow and attach to the walls in a very thin layer along their edges. And they might be thicker in the center of the colony, but on the thin edges we have to work very gently and very carefully and approach it very strategically. Those who teach others about the coral reef ecosystem spend much of their time emphasizing the fragile nature of corals. Using items typically found in a toolbox to pry the colonies of tiny animals off the walls might seem to contradict this notion. But if handled gently and reattached to a stable part of the seafloor using marine epoxy or quick-setting cement, the corals can begin to grow again in their new location. When the project first began, McLaughlin's intent was to transplant the rescued corals in this way. Some colonies gained new homes in the waters of Fort Zachary Taylor State Park and on nearby reefs. But it soon became clear that there were far too many corals to transplant, and not all the specimens were good candidates for this approach. Our initial thought was that we would transplant every coral, but once we started doing the surveys and started figuring out the counts, which tur turned out to be in the thousands, 
we realized it was probably not feasible to be able to transplant all corals, all sizes, all size classes, and all categories, and all species. So we started scrambling and looking around for other options on where we could put corals. And in fact, when we started chipping the corals, we realized that many small fragments would co come off those, these corals that we were chipping. And those corals just don't warrant our time and, and energies for transplantation. However, the big ones, say 20 centimeters or about eight inches or larger, we can transplant. McLaughlin did not want any coral to go to waste. Sanctuary staff quickly spread word among researchers and managers about the wealth of coral samples that were available as they moved corals out of harm's way. Partners from universities, research facilities, public aquaria, and state and national parks stepped forward to help remove the corals for a wide range of research and reef restoration projects. One of those partners is Biscayne National Park, who plans to place rescued corals in its coral nursery to provide a source of coral for repairing injured reefs. There are literally thousands of corals that are on the seawall which will be lost because they're encasing the seawall to expand the quay and uh, if we don't recover those corals they'll be lost and that would, we don't like to see corals that are so much in jeopardy worldwide be lost so what we're running out there is to try and gather these corals put them in a nursery environment keep them growing keep them alive so that we can move them back out to the reef when we have serious groundings or need to restore the reef in one way or another. Removing the corals from the wall is a time-consuming task that requires patience and a delicate hand. Sanctuary staff, Navy contractors, and researchers spent thousands of hours removing corals from the areas slated for destruction. The sanctuary and its partners have transplanted some corals to nearshore reefs where they can continue to thrive. Other corals will help jumpstart the recovery of reefs injured by boats that have run aground. Still others will benefit from coral reef research, helping scientists learn more about coral genetics, coral disease, and other important issues affecting the health of the world's reefs without the need to take samples from the wild. In the end, over 3,500 corals were transplanted and in the winter of 2004, the United States Coral Reef Task Force recognized McLaughlin for her effort. Transplant work continued throughout the summer at vessel grounding sites throughout the Florida Keys. In the end, McLaughlin and her colleagues saved thousands of corals. The Navy and its contractors were able to proceed with a project important to national security with the knowledge that they had done everything possible to protect an unlikely treasure trove of corals.